Glad to have you here today. My name is Jim Warren. I'll be your host today. We've got two great guests and a great program, so we are just excited about uh, getting this stuff knocked out. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. Let's hit the right slides. Uh, yeah, we're going to uh, thank you again. Thank you for joining. We are recording this, and you'll get a link to the recording uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, it takes a little time to get everything compiled and, and do, a, do a little bit of editing on both ends. Uh, so please share it when you get it. It'll be on our webpage. We'll show you where that is in just a second. We'll also be using our go to web webinar. No sound intermediate worked it out. Okay, thank you, Lacey. Um, and uh, we'll be using our go to webcam feature. And again, if you've got questions anytime, go ahead and type them in. And uh, if this is what your screen looks like right now, uh, and it's black otherwise, and you don't see anything else, all you see is a little web web box. Go ahead and double click on that. There's a little box on the right bottom right hand side. If you double click on that, that should take it full screen, and then you should be able to see everything. Everything's going to be broadcast through that one box the way we've got it configured around here. We're doing PowerPoint and Zoom and me and cameras and all kinds of stuff. So it's fun on our side. Sometimes it's crazy, but uh, we'll get it knocked out. Um, so now you should be able to hear me, um, and you should be able to see this slide that says ready to launch, and it should be generally fairly full size on your screen. If not, uh, just shoot me a quick uh, text and let me know um, if something's crashing or not. So anyway, uh, questions at any time, we want you to go ahead and let us know what they are. Uh, you type them in that little box on the right-hand side, make sure you hit the send button. And when you hit the send button, it'll shoot it onto my screen. And so let's give this a try because we are going to do a little polling today. We're going to do a little quizzing as we go. So uh, hey, uh, just type in what city you're from. Uh, just type in your city and hit send. And we've got Dallas, San Marcos, right down the street. Um, so go ahead and do that. And we appreciate that. And we'll just uh, read them off as we get going. So in the meantime, uh, our safety share today is on heat exhaust and heat stroke. Uh, we've got San Antonio, El Paso, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Columbus, Ohio. Hey, welcome, uh, Round Rock, Buda. Um, hey. You just come in the come in here and sit and watch it. Silver City, New Mexico, Far, Amarillo, Amarillo, Pueblo, Mexico. Oh, we got international even. Gilbert, um, Lufkin, Round Rock. All right. Uh, when we got people from all over the place, and you guys are doing a great job of just dialing in. So let's go ahead and get this thing thing going so we can get started. Heat exhaust and the heat stroke, something that we don't want to mess around with. And uh, let's see if I can get this to work out. And uh, uh, there we go. Heat exhaust and symptoms include, and I'm not going to be able to see that, so let's go hit, let me, let me go back and the way that was, headaches, excessive sweating, fatigue, dizziness and fainting spells, nausea and vomiting, not a good day when this happens, guys, weak pulse, a pale face, muscle cramps. You are getting down the road. If you're seeing these kind of symptoms, you are going in the wrong direction. So we want what we want to do is get you cooled off, get you in the shade, have somebody monitor you uh, for quite a while, and, and hopefully we won't get to the next actor, which is heat stroke. When you're starting to see symptoms of heat stroke, now we're looking at behavioral changes, irritability, confusion, disorientation. And for me, that's more than usual. Rapid breathing, uh, hot, dry skin. You may actually stop sweating and just completely stop sweating. That's a doesn't happen all the time, but it happens most of the time. You could have a seizure, you could start throwing up, uh, muscle cramps, abdominal cramps, general weakness. If you see somebody like this, uh, it's, it is time to act. Again, we're going to talk about see something, say something today. Here's definitely a see something, say something. Immediate action on a heat stroke is get somebody to the shade. Find some, Remove any loose clothing that they've got, any excess clothing. You want to cool them off. You want to start dumping water around them. If you've got ice, ice packs. Put it on their neck, uh, in their arms, in their groin area where you got your major veins and, and arteries running to help cool yourself down. And you definitely want to call uh, 911 and seek medical attention. We don't want to mess around with this uh, for sure. That is absolutely something we do not want to mess around with. Um, today's lineup, again, we already did the safety series. We're going to be we're finishing up our, our optimization series. Uh, that's good news and bad news. 
Uh, the good news is it's la it's 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 the last one, and the also really good news is we've recorded the other two, and we've got them online for you, and we'll show you how to get them. Is if you go to TexasAsphalt.org, and click on Education, there's a tab right at the top of the button, top of the screen, and then click on Videos. Um, that'll drop them right down there. We've got uh, our guests today are Todd Mansa with Caterpillar and Chuck Fuller with TechSappa. Guys, we'll say hello. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the session here. Thank you, Jim. There's Todd. Oh, and I'm here, Jim. Uh, going to help Todd uh, do the presentation. So, uh, Todd, I'm going to follow your lead. All right, All right. good deal, guys. So we're going to come right back to them, and uh, uh, this is what we're going to be talking about today. This is what we sent out as an advertisement for the program is to is to uh, get this information out. Um, there we go. Oh, uh, and so that's what we're going to be covering today. And Todd, you're going to go ahead and get your stuff lined up. And so we're going to be ready to go here in just a second. And uh, let's let's uh, let's go ahead and get after it. Again, guys, any questions at any time? We've got um, Manor, Irving, Austin, Houston, Nazareth, uh, Indi India. Uh, there you go, uh, McAllen. Thanks, guys. I uh, appreciate you coming in. Um, so here we go. I'm going to turn it over to Todd. Uh, Chuck and I are we are going to weigh in as we uh, as we move through this program. So uh, we appreciate everybody being on on time today. We've got uh, 72 people on line so far. We had 107 uh, sign up. So <coughs> no, I ain't got the Rona. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Todd, <laughs> and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna get a drink. So there we go. Are you seeing my screen there? Good yep. job. Thank you. Well, good afternoon again, everyone. And a uh, great note before I get started on what Jim mentioned on the safety on, on heat exhaustion and heat stroke. And it definitely is a serious thing. I, I had it at one time and it's, it's not pretty. So with that, uh, today's session, I would like to talk about optimizing paving operations for bonus and quality. So again, as Jim said in the introduction there, uh, if you have questions, please send those in. and I'd like to just kind of kick off what does quality and bonus look like? And I'm passionate about this. I love I love getting in the field and on jobs and, and looking at the map behind the paver. And when that paver is set up properly and everyone's been trained doing their job, the mat behind the screed should look the same right from one end gate to the other. Absolutely. So quite often we see texture differences, you know, especially behind the extensions or the extenders on the screed or maybe a center line stripe or something like that. You're not alone. But again, if that's all set up properly and, and we're, we're paying attention to what we're doing have, and we've had training, that mat should, there's lots of reasons why it may not look uniform, but there aren't too many good reasons why it shouldn't. So I just wanted to kick off with that. Uh, fundamentals, these are just, uh, there's a ton of things we could talk about when it comes to quality and bonus. These are just five of the ones off the top that uh, come to mind. And we'll talk about continuous paving. We'll bring in the compaction part that kind of ties right in with that, with balancing roller speed and paver speed. We'll talk about the takeoffs. So when we sat down to take off, this is a, a, a little pet peeve of mine. When I drive down the road and I'm going down and I, I see where that joint ended, you know, the last paving shift, we stopped here. We came out the next day or the next night, set down the paver and took off. And when I can feel that transverse joint, that butt joint drives me nuts. And it goes back to these takeoffs. So Yeah, that's one of that's one of Chuck's bugaboos too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> transverse joints are my are my pet peeves also. Yeah, yeah. Those I call them wee daddies. <laughs> you drive down the roads and you hit that little bump and you go, wee daddy. And you're looking back and it's the kids in the back seat because they love it, right? And as soon as I hear that, it just drives me nuts. Mm. Uh, nope, kids, we're not backing up and going over it again. Huh. So takeoffs, head of materials, another big one. And last thing I'll touch on here today is uh, thermal profiling. So how we can use that as a quality control tool. In my opinion, uh, as a QC guy, that's my, my background. 
that is one of the best, if not the best quality control tools out there that if, if we take advantage of it and use, use the information we're getting out of it. Good deal. So let's jump in, why continuous paving? Uh, we all know this, it's a little hard to see in that picture, but greed settles when that paver stops, right? So that greed's free floating, it's gonna settle into the mat and leave what? We're gonna leave a bump in the mat. Uh, so it affects smoothness, it affects our density. And I'll show some, a slide later that basically we got different temperature zones there. So if that paver stops and we're stopped, we've typically found more than five minutes five, six minutes is about mm -hmm. the maximum. And if it goes longer than that, that screed wants to settle into the mat and leave a bump that we're not gonna completely get out of there, even with the rollers afterwards. Um, we did. Again, again, smoothness, compaction, because we've got different temperature zones under that screed now. And these are gonna show up in your thermal profiling too, when, you, when that paver takes off again. You can have a, a area underneath the screed plate that's nice and hot. You're gonna have an area under the catwalk that of the screed that never got, uh, or that's cooled off because the, roll, and the rollers never got to it. You can only get so close to the paver. So it's just a lot of, a lot of issues when we stop that paver. Um, starting up again, uh, feed system, head of material. So quite often when we start again, we a lot of risk there of leaving a, a bump or a dip in the mat when we stop. So. I like to say stop is a four letter word in paving. Um, <laughs> so as much as we can, we aim for that continuous paving. And this is really why the shear force, all those forces acting on the screen. As long as we're paving along continuously, those forces we're feeding the mix back to the back to the screen in a uniform manner, the paver, paver speed is constant. All that screed wants to do is make the world smooth, flat and black. It's floating on that mix. It's when we start playing around with those forces or factors acting on that screed that that thickness wants to change, screed wants to go up or it wants to come down. And then that in turn shows up on our, on our smoothness result. I'm not gonna go on all those things acting on the screed, but one of the key ones is paver speed. So what happens if I'm paving along Got a nice mat there, everything looks great, life is good. And all of a sudden I get a bunch of trucks in front of me and I want to speed up that paver because I got I to gotta get rid of those trucks, right? My foreman's yelling at me. What's that screed want to do when I speed up? Stand up. It wants to take a, take a dive on me, right? What happens if I slow down? I start playing with that deceleration pedal on the paver or I pull the propel lever back. Those forces that head of material acting on the screed increases because my conveyors are still running at the same speed, bringing mix back, and that screed wants to rise up. So, so, so Todd, let, Todd, let me ask a question: Is this where stop yeah. is not a dirty word? Where you need to stop if you have to? If you if we keep just changing the speed of the paver continuously, mm -hmm. all we're going to do is change our ride. So, are are you of the subscription? Are you of the religion or 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 mm -hmm. emphasis to Pave at a constant rate. If you can't do that, you stop. Or do you speed up or slow down just to keep the trucks in the, in in the, in in thing? Great question. Uh, the best thing to do is pave at a constant speed. If you're, and then just if you have to stop, just come to a complete stop quickly. And when it's time to start up again, start up quickly. And the whole idea behind that is. If you'd make a quick stop, and the pavers nowadays are designed, I mean, you pull them right to neutral and stop, and, and when you take off again, they take off quickly but smoothly. It's not like not like 30 years ago when the, you know you could throw the guys off the back of the screen. Those, those <laughs> days are gone. <laughs> but great question. So quick starts and stops if you do have to stop. And the reason there is it leaves a full head of material. Your conveyors are full. So you, you really haven't changed anything if you, if you make those quick stops. But if you slow down gradually, and this is what they taught me when I first got into paving, mm -hmm. that's paver operator slows down and, you know, I only see one truck in front of me and I'm going to run out of mix. So I just going to milk it along, milk it along as long as you can. Milk it as long as I can. But not and anymore. That's where you get those long waves in the mat. 
and we never had IRI back in those days, so it never picked that up, right? Mm -hmm. So, but great question, yeah. So keep her moving, and when you can't move anymore, just come to a stop and take off quickly again. So another thing here on the effects of paver stops. So just a quick look. There's the thermal images I was kind of talking about there. So every time we have a long paver stop, and again, when I say long paver stop, I'm talking five or six minutes or more. So two minutes isn't going to hurt us. Uh, but you can see all the temperature differentials in there. So you got mixing the auger chamber itself. Uh, under the hot screed plate, under the catwalk, and then immediately behind the catwalk where the roller can't get to until the paver moves. So you've really got four different temperature zones there. If you're a roller operator, you're probably you're gonna feel that when you go over it. That breakdown operator is gonna feel the different temperatures as he or she goes over that area. Hey Todd, I got a question before you already come in. What yeah. is what is recommended for screed holding pressure? and delay times and it got chopped off and for, yeah. yeah go ahead great question so on the uh, and i'm assuming that relates to the paver stop so a lot of pavers nowadays i think most if not all of them have what we call a screed lock feature or halt or different names for it so when the paver comes to a stop it basically locks the lift cylinders so that the screed can't settle so that's the idea behind that. Okay. And then when you take off, it releases that screed lock. So the screed becomes free floating again. I personally like to leave that delay at about a one second, something like that, just really short. Okay. And uh, the reason for that is if I've come to a quick stop and everything, everything should be should be right there when I when I take off again. Thank so. you. Great question. And then uh, I've had I've had people ask too. So going back to the slide we're looking at right now, and that screed lock feature, which is a great feature, helps stop that screed from settling into the mat and, and leaving a big bump. But it still doesn't answer all our problems. It's not a not a free ticket to do a bunch of paver stops because of what you're looking at right now. Hey Chuck, so did you, Chuck, did Chuck, did you run into that? Absolutely. So yeah, what Todd is saying is that uh, that that paper assist or that screen assist is 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 not going to not get away from the fact that you're going to have uncompacted mats behind that that paper. These different temperatures that he's showing right here is just a, is proof that you're just going to have you're going to have uh, different uh, compaction efforts, you know, because of the temperature requirements, and uh, you're definitely going to feel it, see it, and uh, it's possibly going to cause you future distress. You know, later on, and uh, as the pavement, uh, you know, oxidizes and wears. So the operative word here is an assist. It's not a get out of jail free card. Yes, it's an assist. Exactly. And I uh, got a question: Does thermal image occur? Does thermal image occur across entire mat? And is and is if data, and is the data recorded? Yes, on the on the laser uh, or on the thermal imaging can, uh, systems. Yes, the image is recorded, and it is recorded all the way across the mat. On the cameras, on the handheld cameras, uh, it is what you pointed at. And there, right now in the in the specification, there is a there's a very established procedure on how to do that in uh, text 244F. So we got a poll question coming up. Okay. There, Jim. Yep. Uh, and on your screen as well. So just out of curiosity, do you have a paving plan that your team discusses before shift that includes paver speed, roller speed, roller settings, so amplitude, frequency on steel drum, number of passes, and truck spacing? So, so the poll the is, the poll is open right now. The options we have there are yes, all of these items, uh, some of these items, or no, we don't discuss a paving plan at all. Okay, we'll just give it a couple more seconds here. So the, the important the important question here, or the important part of this question is, discuss before the shift. You know, so I, I know that paving plans are usually discussed at a prepaid meeting, or they're discussed, you know, between an estimator and a project manager, but each shift is different. 
that's the thing that's getting you right here. Each shift uh, is going to be a, a, it's a different day. So that's, that's the real portion of this. Is it, is it discussed before the shift starts? All right. Yeah. So let's go ahead and close the that's poll. Great. Point. Let's see how this works. And uh, I'm not sure the data is showing up on your side, but on my side, it says at a 39% for A, a 50% for B, and 11% for C. So well, it says 80, 80, 89% are doing either some or all the items. So that's awesome. That is that's awesome. awesome. That's really good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. That's awesome. That yeah. You're and, talking about that stuff. Yep. And just a couple uh, to answer your question, Doug, the thermal image, um, they it is recorded. The data is recorded. And then uh, Jim had a question. Paving plans also in, should include plant output. And I agree with you 100%, sir. Once we get into the balancing operations, we'll bring that in. And I think Todd's got some slides on that. So great, great, great observation. Great question. Back to you, Todd. Yeah, great questions. Yeah. And that, uh, mentioning plants uh, kind of reminded me too last, last week when TJ was on with the uh, plants. Mm -hmm. One of the things he emphasized and mentioned continuously was consist or eliminating variability or managing variability. Well, that's no different here when we get out on the road. So plant guys do all their hard work, make that, you know, managing variability, producing a good mix and loading it in trucks and sending it out to our job site. Well, the things we're talking about here today are really, when it comes down to it, a continuation of that. It's managing variability. I mean, we've got all these details to and paper speed is one of those one of those things. So with that, we talk continuous uh, continuous paving and a paving plan with the paver speed. So I always like to start my paving plan with the tonnage. So our estimators bid jobs and and at the end of the day, you know, they bid the job on so many tons per per shift for us as a company to to put that mix down in a in a quality manner and and make money and take advantage of any bonus money that's out there. Mm -hmm. So with that, again, my paving plan, when I do it, I like to take that tonnage, that's my starting point. So I take the tonnage and I come up with, from there I go and look, and look at a paver speed. That's gonna get me that tonnage over the course of, of, a, of a shift and then of course, in the big picture over the course of the entire job. So that's all I'm showing on here again. Um, the CAT paving production calculator app, and I'm not here to do an advertisement, but it's a really handy tool. If you uh, go into the app store for Apple or Google Play and, and search for the Cat Caterpillar paving production calculator, this thing will come up and, and it does a really nice job of uh, planning paver speeds and compaction uh, and all and all that stuff that you want to include in a paving plan. Yeah, we've, we've a, got a uh, we've got we've got that on our website too, Todd, in a couple different places. Uh, I had a question come in. Um, the problem comes after we start the paving process. Uh, we get problems, truck breaks down, paver issues with the paver, et cetera, et cetera. How do we adjust for that uh, in this operation? And that's what I call real world paving. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when that stuff happens, number one, uh, it's always good to have a plan B, as I'll call it, or even a plan C. Absolutely. So that's when that happens, that's when I that's when I look at, okay, I still want to meet my tonnage. Can I I basically go through what I'm gonna show you here in a few slides um, and figuring out a paver speed and just saying well, can I up my paver speed to, you know, I've got a shorter window now because I've been down for an hour with uh, trucks broken down or a plant breakdown or something. And so that's where I'll, where I'll start. But at the end of the day, there's only so much that you can do. It depends mm -hmm. on the equipment you have on site. I think it'll be a little easier for me to answer and maybe even a little more clear after the next few slides here. Okay, well, go ahead then. Yeah. So what you've seen here, this is just a pretty, I'll call it generic example of balancing 
plant production, trucking, paver, and roller. So again, either using the app or I personally, I still scratch it out on a napkin because I don't trust things I can't see. But um, so the tonnage for the day, 2,500, eight hour paving window in this example, 18 ton end dumped. And you'll see why it matters on end dumps in a few minutes. Uh, 12 feet wide, two inch overlay, 12 and a half mil mix. And we were given three different rollers. So either those are the rollers the, you know, they sent to the job or maybe in an ideal world, we got to choose the rollers that we wanted. So I input those things into the, into the production calculator again, or I just do the calculations manually. And what it does is ends up come, giving me, and there's the seven inputs you're looking at on the screen that you need to do this. Uh, it comes up and gives me an effective paver speed. So that effective paver speed at the end of the day is getting rid of 2,500 tons over eight hours at 12 feet wide and two inches thick. So on the calculator here, you'll see, you know, different efficiencies for the paver. There's only two that I look at. And the one number that you see circled there, 30 feet a minute, 29.8, is at 100% efficiency. So if I'm using a pickup machine, windrow elevator, material transfer vehicle, I'll use 100% because in a perfect world, again, ideally, I want to keep that paver moving. That's my goal, continuous paving. So if I pave at 30 feet a minute nonstop with a, with a transfer vehicle or a pickup machine, uh, I can pave 30 feet a minute for eight hours, get rid of 2,500 tons. If I'm using end dumps, I'm going to look at 75% efficiency. Going back to, to Jim's comment there about do I slow the paper down or just come to a complete stop? Well, we found better smoothness results when you just come to a complete stop in between trucks and dumps. So I'll use 75% efficiency for end dumps for a paver speed. So it's going to be a little, little bit higher of a paver speed. So when the paver is actually moving, I'll be going a little faster. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. 15 minutes out of an hour, I'm sitting, waiting in between the truck exchange. So do that. The other thing the calculator is going to give you is the number of trucks. So here's 20 trucks in this example. Again, 2,500 tons over eight hours nonstop. Uh, there's my paver speed with end dump. So I'm picking off that 75% number. So I got to pave at 36 feet a minute in this example to get rid of the 2,500 over eight hours. So ta-da, you know, I got a paver speed based on the tonnage that the estimators gave me. Uh, I've got number of trucks that I need. And now what I've got to figure out is the rolling part of it, right? So this goes back to the, to the gentleman's question, right? We get interruptions with mm -hmm. trucks and things like that. I think pretty everybody knows that for the most part that is the real uh the real hang up when it comes to that continuous paving isn't it it's traffic or trucking i think that real world paving plan has definitely that needs to be talked about so uh, on our website we have the all hands paving plan and uh what that does Tom, is it actually talks about all these different scenarios when a truck breaks down when equipment breaks down when a when the, uh, an accident happens or something happens, uh, I don't have the answer before the question's asked. I think it's real important to know that if all of a sudden my trucks, you know, get out of a traffic queue or an accident queue where they can't get to the job site, what do I do at this point? You know, what do I do? Do I, like you said, do you stop? Do you wait until you get all the trucks in front of you? Uh, in other words, kind of have that conversation before it actually happens. And I'm a firm believer that the real world paving we can talk about this moment. Real world paving. We all know that we're going to have a we're going to have a truck that's going to dump in front of the paver. We're going to have breakdowns and what have you. Let's let's talk about that as a team, you know, before it happens and involve your inspector, whoever that is. You know, if it's Textile or if it's somebody representing Textile, involve that individual. If we have a rain event, we have a breakdown. These are the three or four things that we're going to try to try to do. So I, I believe the real world paving definitely needs to be talked about every shift yeah I, th I think that i think that the, the don't panic the don't panic it's mm. you know 
because it's going to happen. You and and you guys are absolutely right. Plan A, Plan B. Sometimes you need Plan C and Plan D. But you and and if you talk about these things ahead of time, when there's no stress going on in the midst of it, you'll be able to just kind of make execute and move on. And and you won't have to like, yeah, we talked about that. We're just going to do such and such. All right. So we just go on instead of getting into confrontation. Less, 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 that's the last thing you want is a confrontation when everything's going south. So you just have those, have plan B, plan C, and do make adjustments and move on. Don't panic. Uh, hang in there. It'll be all right. Hey, Amen. <laughs> no, that's, that's, no, that's perfect. I mean, yeah, you don't make good decisions when you're, when you're in the middle of it, fighting on a job. All right, guys, you know, we are halfway through our program. So we got to, we're probably going to have to pick it up just a little bit. So let's, uh, Let's yep. keep going. Okay, so trucking, again, I'm not gonna talk about this. I just wanted to show, I think, uh, again, there's a bazillion uh, vendors out there now with trucking, I'll call them apps, but you know, things to help you manage your trucking, GPS and all that. And I know a lot of, a lot of, a lot of you are using this stuff now. So that, going back to the, the continuous paving and all that, in my experience, trucking has always been probably number one uh, as far as if we can get that dialed in, mm -hmm. our, our continuous paving is going to fall fall into place. This is just a spreadsheet. We used to give these to the to the plant operator. Uh, this is 15 years ago now, so so we've graduated from Excel sheets in a lot of ways. But it just gave loadout times to manage that truck spacing and that continuous flow of trucks to the paver. So you know, in this example, I think it was every five minutes or every seven minutes. Uh, changes in paver speed. So we already talked about that. Speeding up, slowing down, it's just going to end up leaving long waves in the mat. Does that mean I can never speed up or never slow down? Of course not. But the thing as a paver operator that you have to keep in mind if you're going to speed that paver up or slow it down is you have to make adjustments to your feed system, so your conveyors and your augers. And uh, that's the big thing. Because at the end of the day, what you want to do is maintain a consistent head of material or forces acting on the screed. And we'll, we'll talk about that more a little later here. I got, I got one comment that came in, Todd. Um, we currently use a, well, let's see if I can summarize this, currently run a paving tracking system that allows track all the information as soon as the paver, paver powers up, on, off, Travel versus paving, paving efficiency, speed of paver with truck estimated versus real time tonnage per hour versus a real time engine hours location, measuring distance on real map. I guess that's all te telemetrics, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And that's that's great. You guys are using that. That's awesome, Dustin. That is awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's so much information and uh, it can be information overload. And and I've seen it happen, had it happen to me. and Again, it's all great information. I think what you have to do, and I know, I know you didn't ask the question, but I'm <laughs> just going off here now. But with all that information, uh, pick the big things that are your big, mm. you know, if I could say problems, or pick the biggest ones first. Get the low-hanging fruit. Major, then, major on the majors, minor on the minors. Yeah. Right. So we got a paper speed going to get rid of that tonnage, all that. We're going to look at the rollers. We were given the number of rollers or the types of rollers. So what do I need to think about when it comes to compaction now? I got a constant paver speed, so so that's a good thing. Continuous paving, but I also want continuous rolling. So I got to think about the rolling pattern, the sequence, the amplitude and frequency settings on the steel drum, um, temperature, how fast that mix is cooling. So that's going to really depend on how tight my rolling pattern needs to be, how close do the rollers have to be together, um, drum width in terms of, you know, how many pass pattern. The big thing here for today that I would really like you to uh, get out of this is, uh, is the frequency determines roller speed. So we've got a paver speed figured out already. Now we want these rollers to be able to keep up with the paver, but it's the frequency setting, how fast that drum vibrates. Uh, that really determines roller speed. And got got a poll question coming up here, and then I'll dive into the into the uh, roller speed bit. So, out of curiosity, on what basis 
you set the breakdown roller speed. So we're talking about the roller or rollers right right behind the paver. All right, set the, it, pole, the pole is up. Do you set it based on frequency as fast as I can go and get density? So push the limits, but still get your density numbers or whatever speed it takes to keep up with the paver. Leave this so over this for, the for a little bit there. Point of uh, curiosity here on uh, on how people tuned in here today and listen uh, or face <laughs> face the roller speed. We are getting a broad cross section here. I know the real world answer here. Yeah. <laughs> real world answer is not even up there. <laughs> All right, uh, a couple more seconds, guys. <laughs> well, I was trying to be polite, Chuck, so I didn't put the Here real world answer and up there. <laughs> five, four, three, two, one, and close. All right. We got 47% said based on the frequency setting. 25% said as fast as I can go and get density. And 28% on number C. So a broad right. cross section. Good so job, these, guys. Thanks for weighing in. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all for for getting in there. Based on frequency is really the is the best answer here. And and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, if you can go fast and get density, I guess that's a good thing as long as it's not affecting smoothness results exactly. as well. Exactly. That's the key there. And C, that's kind of more the real world answer, right? A poor, poor roller operator. At the end of the day, if that paver's doing 100 feet a minute, that roller's probably doing 100 feet a minute. Right. Yeah, but up. what let me let me jump in there. What good does that do if you lay a hundred feet a minute and you gotta go pick it up tomorrow with a milling machine because you didn't get density? I mean So y'all y'all know there's two two mil paving or there's a a one mil paving crew and a two mil paving crew, right? So you got the one I'm mil afraid crew, that, I'm a mil, afraid a mil that. in front of a paver yeah. and the two mil crew has one in front and one behind, right? Oh, we don't want a two mil paver, that's for sure. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, keep it on. Great comment. It does you no good because coming back to do it again always costs more. <laughs> uh, the screen just showing a rolling, everything that's involved in a rolling pattern. So I'm not going to go into all that detail today. But you got temperature, number of passes or coverage, uh, roller settings, so amplitude and frequency, uh, speed of the roller. But just real quick, amplitude and frequency again are the two settings. So amplitude's how hard it's hitting. That's your compactive effort. But you really set your amplitude based on, in layman's terms, how hard do I want to hit it, right? Uh, frequency, and this goes back to our poll question, is really what controls how fast that roller should be moving. So that's the number of impacts per foot. That's that drum vibrating whether it's at a high amplitude or a low amplitude as that roller goes down, down the road. So on the left side of your screen there, you can see six impacts per foot. So that's literally one impact of that drum on the mat every two inches, which is pretty far apart. Right? You'll see that. You can see it. You can and feel on it. right, you got 12. There you go, Jim. There you go. So you, yep. so you see that impact spacing like jim said you can see that on the mat when it's uh when it gets bad enough and that basically it's well not basically it is the roller going at too high a speed for the frequency setting that it's that it's on so what we target this is just kind of industry standard for density and, and smoothness is that 10 to 14 impacts per foot i might get away with eight impacts per foot and get density but I can pretty much guarantee you are not going to get your IRI at less than 10 impacts per foot. So you're getting your impacts about an inch apart, essentially. It's about 12, about inch, 12 inch impact per foot. One in, got a real quick question. Do most paving crews keep keep track on the type of mix and the densities that they're getting? We got a general poll question. Everybody, if you want to weigh in, uh, let us know. Um, I hope they do. I hope at least the QC guy does, um, the 1B. 
I guess the question also reflects back to the fact that when do you set your amplitude and your frequency? You know, do you set it to the mix? Do you set it to the day that you're laying it? Do you set it to the thickness? When do you set that amplitude and that, that frequency, Todd? Um, at the test section. And whether that's a, a formal test section, you know, part of the job or not, or whether it's, you know, maybe maybe the job you're on doesn't require a, an official test or control strip, but you do that on the first day of production and, and figure it out. And figure it out during the rolling patterns, right? Yeah. yeah. You, you want to get the rollers off of it as soon as possible. You want to get your, establish your density, get your density, and then get the rollers off of it. You don't want the rollers to sit there and beat the heck out of it. You want to be able to set that amplitude, set that frequency to for your rolling patterns to get your maximum density uh, as quick as possible. Yeah, and a couple, and a comment coming here from Sterling. Our our crews carry a PQI and measure the density at every pass until a rolling pattern is established for that mix, and then they continue to check and confirm our rolling pattern daily throughout the project. And that's awesome. Good job. That is awesome. Yeah, that is it is great. And those PQIs are nice. They're, I mean, they're easy to easy to grab and put down on the mat and check things. Excellent. So most of the rollers on the market, if all of them that I know of, uh, for the highway sized rollers, actually have features on them to control that roller speed based on frequency. So uh, even on the old old machines, they most everyone I've ever seen highway sized roller has a if not automatically controlled like they they are on the new machines, they have a gauge on them that. Uh, you can see in the picture in the bottom right there shows that 10 to 14 impacts per foot range. I know a lot of times those gauges don't work after after several years, but but we got to target really focus on targeting that uh, 10 to 14, and and it's just tied into roller speed and frequency. So I'm not going to get into a math class here, but 10 is a nice even round number for impacts per foot, and it's if I use 10, that's as fast in my, my quality world as I want that roller to go. So I, all I do is take the frequency, whatever it is on my roller, divide it by 10. And that gives me that roller speed in feet per minute. It's that simple to figure it out. Uh, so again, it just comes from frequency on the roller. So it comes to knowing, knowing the roller settings, but mm -hmm. divide it by 10 feet per minute. And if you like miles per hour, divide that by 88, 88 will give yeah. you miles per hour. Yeah. I had a question. Is uh, amplitude and frequency linked together? They, great question. Uh, yes and no. So it depends, again, on the machine. One thing I will say as a big red flag to pay attention to is on most rollers on the market, if you are on the, that have more than one amplitude and more than one frequency setting, if you are set on the highest amplitude, that's the hardest hitting, they will generally default to a lower frequency setting. So if you've got three amplitudes and three frequencies on your roller, um, the highest frequency may not work on the highest amplitude setting. So you, you do have to be careful of that. Yeah, um, physics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tear the equipment yeah. up. There, yeah. there, there was another question came in. Are we going to discuss intelligent compaction? I don't believe so. We're going to have time to cover that today. That'll have to mm -hmm. be another seminar. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't on the plan. Yeah. Go ahead. And then as a QC guy, you know, I'm just counting number of passes for the breakdown roller until I get my, you know, I'm, I'm feeling good when I get about 90% with the breakdown roller. So 90%. Uh, of my max density. Um, if I get there, I feel pretty good that with the intermediate and roller, I'm gonna be able to hit my 90, my, my 92, 93, 94, uh, depending on the mix, of course. But but I, I don't like to see that breakdown roller moving on before, before he gets 90% compaction. At least. At least, yeah. yeah. And I'm recording the temperature, so I do all that stuff, and that's this is my control strip or my test strip. So that's all I wanted to show there. Um, 
just going to kind of skip over this one here, uh, Jim. It's mm -hmm. just showing um, a five pass pattern. So as an example, in that picture, I have a 84 inch wide drum, a 12 foot lane, a drum width can cover the full lane, the full 12 feet in two drum widths with six inches of overlap and overhang on the edge. Uh, if I have to cover that whole mat two times, that becomes what we call a five pass pattern. Mm -hmm. So the picture yeah. shows two rollers. My, my objective here was to pretend that that's one roller going up and back on one side and then up and back on the other side. But two rollers working in breakdown actually are very, very efficient uh, operation. Very efficient. Yeah. I love seeing echelon breakdown rolling whenever, whenever possible. I mean, it's, as Jim said, much more efficient. You're taking advantage of temperature. The mat's not cooling on one side. Well, that one roller is going back and forth. And then real quick, so we said 252 feet a minute for the roller. I've got a five pass pattern, divide it by five. Now my effective roller speed. So this is the ability of that roller to keep up with the paver. Now is 50 feet a minute. But what's the roller got to do? He's got to stop at the end of his pass, uh, turn out at an angle, shut the, or shut the vibe off, turn at an angle and change direction. So we put a fudge factor in there. So 80% mm. is a pretty good roller operator. So that's to account for changing direction on that uh, rolling pass. So our effective roller speed is 40 feet a minute. And that's how, how we do that. So frequency, divide by 10, divide by your number of passes, multiply by 0.8. And the calculator does all this for you. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to show you where it's coming from. So paver can't go over. What was the paver? It was. 36, 36 feet a minute, yeah. right? So you're good to go. So life, life's good, yeah. right? Hey, I had, a, had one more question come in. I, and I, yeah. I think this can get confusing sometimes. So so, and, it, and he's, the question is regarding amplitude and frequency. So most of the rollers have both amplitude and frequency settings or only amplitude as frequency is now speed of the roller. Um, so uh, I mean, Ampli again, to go back through, amplitude is the height of the drum. Effectively, it's, it's about how high the drum is lifted before it comes back down. That's amplitude. Frequency is how many yeah. times it hits in a given minute. So the, yeah. the drum is lifting, but the, the, the roller is also moving. So it's lifting and dropping in different places as it goes down the mat. So the combination of height or amplitude and frequency is what drives in the density from that particular roller. Um, there was another question. What's your definition of one pass? And that's always oh. a good. What's a pass versus a coverage? Uh, oh, uh, here we go. Busted. Here we go. You Thank you, Dan. You, that's a great question. It is a great question, and you busted me. Thank you for doing that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, my my definition of a pass is from point A to point B. So depending on where you are in the country, uh, one pass can be from point. A to point B and, and back. But for the purpose of the way my language here, uh, one pass is just from point A to point B. Across so the width I, across the width of the roller or just the width of the roller? The width of the roller. Okay. So yeah. see I always use coverage as the complete the number of passes it would take to cover the mat one time. And yes. I would look at repeat coverage is, is really what you needed to get density. Yes. And so it's exactly. the combination of passes and coverage, and that's where you get the the influence of the width of the drum of the roller uh, working with the width of the mat, and and finding that uh, that magic bullet as to what's going to work. And that's why a number of years ago, rollers kind of got sized up to 78 inch machines and 84 mm -hmm. inch machines, where they could make a two pass coverage and cover the width of the mat very efficiently, and then. When SuperPave came on, then we started getting into higher densities, and then we started using two rollers, kind of working in echelon side by side, and so they could actually cover the mat with each pass that they made effectively. So it was a, a big change. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, 
Excellent point. We got uh, uh, 10 minutes, man. We were running out of time. Oh, better be smoking along here. Okay, is this a good place to start when I do take off? <laughs> the answer is no. No. <laughs> so what I'd like to do here is uh, talk a little bit quickly on set, setting down and taking off with the paver. So what we've done here in, uh, is what we call our, our paving by the numbers training. And it's 15 steps to setting that paper down and taking off. And I'm not going to hit all of these. Uh, this is available uh, for anybody who wants it. And again, just because it says CAD on there, it works on any paper. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a good, if you Google it on, there's a YouTube video on it as well. If you just want to Google YouTube. Yeah. And it's also on our website. It's also on our website. Yep. Pages. Yeah, it's absolutely. So if you follow these steps religiously, you won't have those wee daddies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's like anything, takes a little practice. But when you get in the groove of doing doing these steps, I mean, it's just like putting your seatbelt on. For us old timers, remember before seatbelt laws and you never wore one. And then it took a little adjustment getting in, the, getting in your vehicle and re actually remembering to, to click it. Yep. And uh, this is the same thing. I mean, you just do it like habit, but heat the screen up so it doesn't stick. And again, I'm just going to hit some of the really what I consider the more. Yeah, uh, keep going because we've got a few more questions that have come in, and let's just kind of hit hit the high points and yeah, we, we'll answer the rest of the questions. So, a big thing here is starter boards. So everybody knows when you set the screen down, you got to set it down on on some boards. And believe it or not, there's still pavers out there that don't do this, they just set it right on the ground and take yep. off. And yep. there's there's your weed daddy and your segregation and your <laughs> raveled transverse joint and all kinds of bad things. And then, then we don't do it right, so we pick up, back up, drop it and do it again, right? But starter boards, biggest thing here is just having them long enough to go all the way under the screen. So that if that's really the only point I wanna get across here. Uh, I can talk about reasons why you want them, but you want those boards three to four feet long so they're underneath the main screed and the extender. I used to be the guy the paving crew would send in the ditch to find a soda can or something to <laughs> put underneath or a rock and try to get two the same size and it doesn't work. Because if I do that and set the screed on it and take off, my screed nose is over, yeah. rolls over and there's your wee daddy. Yeah. So these guys, no starter boards, uh, terrible. Yeah, you lay a you lay a, a straight edge out there. There's going to be a dip. Yeah, there's I mean they're even in the center and they haven't even hit a roller on it yet. Right? Something else that uh, that needs to be that needs to be looked at, Todd, is on a uh, at the end of the paving ship when they transition down. You know they they'll, what they'll do is they'll put a taper in the uh, in the mat so that yeah. you know you no know, traffic can do it. And then at the beginning of the next ship, they'll come back and saw cut and remove that taper. It's imperative that all the way across that that mat is that you have the same thickness. If you're laying a two-inch mat, it needs to be two inches all the way across that 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 transverse joint. If you're if you're an inch and a half here and an inch and a quarter here and an inch, you need to come back on that taper and saw cut it to where you get the full mat thickness. Uh, if you don't have the full mat thickness, then starter boards or anything else won't help you because you're not matching. The existing pavement structure at that full thickness that you're trying to get. Yeah, that's a yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, sure. we used to just tell people to take it, take your take your 10 foot straight edge, make sure it's straight, run it back mm -hmm. on the pavement, and you just you just keep edging towards that joint until you see some air underneath there, and that's where you got your full thickness. Is when that starts to dip off, that's where you cut your cut your line just a little bit behind that. Then you'll be even all the way across. You should be even all the way across. Um, even yeah, I gotta let's see. Um excellent point. Before yeah. we let's see, uh any let, what's your what's your opinion on rubber tire rollers, guys? I love them. <laughs> <laughs> or did you want a little more detail? No, I mean I just I mean was was there any compare the question was there any comparison used in rubber tire rollers? And you know, to me they compact differently. It's a different mechanism than a yeah. steel wheel roller. So if I've always felt that if you're trying to get an impermeable, impermeable pavement, a rubber tire roller in conjunction with the steel wheel rollers will be very effective. 
I've been I've been in some states where they use a rubber tire breakdown. It's scary as heck the first time you see it, but uh, it works. It works. <laughs> but the combination of using those uh, properly aired up, and we've got don't have time to get into that today. Maybe that'll be another another webinar we can do sometime. But the combination of those things is is good. Um, and then uh, somebody else said, so it's best now to run Echelon on the surface mixes instead of running pneumatics. Uh, Greg, thanks for the question. What what, what do you guys think? Uh, yeah, I mean, it all, you know, in a great world of paving, it all depends, right? Yep. It depends on the mix and and, yep. uh, and the thickness. I mean, those are the two big things. A lot of polymer mixes, you can't use a rubber tire or pneumatic roller mm -hmm. because it's going to pick up and pick up your mat. So there's just two thought processes there. I know a bunch of contractors that don't like the pneumatic. Mm -hmm. And they'll just run the two, the two in a an echelon, and then a, a finish roller. Uh, and then I know some that just cannot get full density, can't get full bonus unless they run the uh, the rubber tire, the 20 ton pneumatic tires. And uh, pay attention to them, keep their tires hot, you know, keep them running the whole time. Uh, don't let them stop. All that stuff needs to go into play. Yep. If you do pneumatics, like you said, you need to make sure that the temperature is correct on the uh, that they're not picking up. The tire pressures are the same, and all the tires are the same. Mm -hmm. you know, if you've got variable size tires or tire pressures, you're going to have issues with picking up mix. So that stuff needs to be played into uh, when you're thinking about the pneumatic. But I'm with you, Todd. I'm a pneumatic guy. I like the pneumatic tire. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother David has always ran them. Uh, I've always been around them. That's the only thing we've ever used. But uh, there's definitely two thought processes there. Mm -hmm. I uh, got, so got, got a one question here over a scabbed mill surface. I found the rubber tire to do better. That's interesting. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, if you're vibrating, yeah. you're generally going to crack that, uh, crack that scab. Just, just, yeah. a, just a thought. If you're running into a lot of scab surfaces, that's something that needs to be brought up to the project people. And inevitably, I've seen projects fail because of scab surfaces that were paved over and not cleaned up. So that's something. If it does, if you start seeing scabs. Uh, let, let's get that sorted out. Um, got another another comment. Found that rubber tires do better oscillate um, do better. Also, oscillating roller works great in place of pneumatic. So, uh, somebody likes to use an oscillatory roller in lieu of a pneumatic. So again, they're compacting a little bit differently. I guess we're going to have to do a compaction seminar because we are <laughs> three minutes to go, Todd. So let's wrap it up. I know we're we're, right. we're just getting started here on on <laughs> paver stuff, and we have burned through this hour in no time. So wrap it up. Give me give me your let's let's roll it up now. Um, what? How, well, if how you see something out there, say something. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. that mat that mat should look the same from one end gate to the other. I yeah. mean, if you're seeing the uh, lines behind the paver like you can see in this picture uh you don't have to be an expert to say any say something but if you know something isn't right uh yeah and you know you can be nice about it but ask mm -hmm. ask questions um i'll be on I'll, I'll be the first guy to tell you i when i first started out in quality control i was intimidated out there on the road with the oh, absolutely. paving crew and yeah. the you're not the foreman only one. And, and all that and i was afraid to ask questions and i look back and i wish i had of and uh anyhow they you know they the paving crew can tell you and a lot of times it's even something maybe beyond their control i've had guys say yeah i know you're seeing a line there but it's because our you know our equipment department won't fix that thing or something like that you know it's just yeah. but but you bring up a great point about communication. I mean, everybody on that crew is responsible for safety and quality. Everybody on that crew. Yep. If somebody saw somebody that's like walking in between the pieces of equipment or, you know, or, or what have you, they would say something. They would stop that individual. It's the same thing with quality. If that pneumatic tire roller or that, that steel wheel roller drive ran over that transverse joint and can fill it, you know you're going to fill it in a dang vehicle. Mm -hmm. So. They need to say something. They're responsible for safety and for quality. Everybody on that crew is not just a QC guy and not just the paving superintendent. Everybody is responsible for quality and safety. And you're exactly right, Todd. If you see something, you need to say something. You see a line like that that comes out, they need to be able to fix any kind of visual segregation. You should be able to fix it in the field as you're going. 
you know, so uh, I'm a firm believer that communication, there you go, communication. There you go, man. It's all, about, it. it's, all about, it's all about, it's all about talking about it. And guess what? If we talk about it before it happens, you know, at the beginning of the shift, let's have our toolbox safety meeting. Let's talk about what we're going to do. Let's talk about how we're going to get there. Let's talk about who's responsible. And by God, it only takes a few minutes. It only takes a few minutes to be able to discuss those items and, and to buy into um, getting a quality quality payment. But I love that that slide there. Communication. It's all about communication, guys. Good yeah. deal. So wrap it, it up. It wrap is. it up, Todd. Yeah, uh, it is. It's all about communication. We can go over all the details of how to do this and that, and if we don't talk about it and share that with everybody involved. Uh, you know, we're, we're behind the eight ball as far as getting quality and, and getting bonus. And the taxpayers, is, you know, they want value for their money. We take pride in the work we do. And I think that should be a big thing in everybody's mind when, when we're out there. Uh, I like to drive over that road and be proud of the fact that I was, was part of it. So, but yeah, do the fundamentals right and do them consistently and you'll have a quality map. The culture of craftsmanship. I mean, that's one of the things that TJ had, had brought up last week, and I, I'm using it in all my in all my conversations, is that we're craftsmen out there, or, or the guys that are out there building the roads, they're craftsmen, and it's the culture of craftsmanship. And uh, by golly, they, they're doing a great job out there. There's no doubt we've seen some award-winning projects over the last three or four months doing these uh, payment evaluations. We've got some really, really nice roads in Texas, guys. We do really, really got some good yeah. good things to be proud of. Yep, absolutely. and that's unique about paving because we all the challenges and the every day is a different day, like Chuck said earlier. And you know, you think about it, there's a lot of lot of industries where it's the same thing every day, right? <laughs> and and we deal with all these constant changes, so so you should be proud of yourselves for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Hey guys, we are running out of time. I got one more note from uh, Raymond. He said, "Always check the mat with a string at the at the start of each day." to make sure there's no dips in the mat. You are absolutely right. Thank you for the tip. Guys, it's been an awesome day. I knew this was going to be fun. I knew we were going to have a good time today. And I knew we were going to run out of time. I just didn't know we were, we were, we were probably not halfway through our stuff. But you know, material or anything. I know. I mean, uh, I know. hey, that you was... know, everybody with almost 80 people on board today, you guys have asked more questions than we've had on any of our seminars. We really do appreciate you guys weighing in here. Uh, please, when you get this uh, video or when you get the link to it, share it. Um, Todd, I guess we're going to have to negotiate a, a return trip to Texas here, <laughs> at least virtually, and, and yeah. get you back on so you can finish. And uh, probably we'll be, I'm thinking right now, probably October, we've already kind of talked about maybe doing something else. So uh, we need to get on, get on our calendar, get something lined up. So uh, everybody, thank you so much. Now, the thing that we didn't talk about is that we are in the middle of the paving season and we've got the opportunity to take this stuff and apply it on tonight's night shift or tomorrow's paving. So we expect you guys to go ahead and take this stuff that you learned, at least up to this point, this will get you started and this will get you balanced. Um, and we're gonna have a great time, uh, great time making great payments uh, for Texas and this country. So. Um, that's going to be it for today. Thank you. Be safe out there. Stay hydrated. Um, let's get rid of this COVID thing and move on. Yeah. And uh, God bless everybody. Uh, have a great day. Have a great week. And uh, we love you. Be safe. Bye-bye now. All right. Thank you all. Hey, good morning. Jim Warren with TechSAPA. If you were on our Optimizing Paving Practices webinar yesterday, you realized we ran out of time because we were having so much fun covering the information we did, and we had a great turnout, and we had a great questions that were associated with that. So what we're planning on doing is we're going to do part two next week on August the 11th from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, there'll be a link provided in the uh, newsletter from TechSampa. You can go on the website as well. So we encourage you to come back and bring your friends for part two next week for optimizing paving practices. We'll see you there.